Welcome to Revolution Against Evolution. I'm your host, Doug Sharp. I'm your co-host, Rich Gear, and we're here to talk to you some more about dinosaur anomalies and carbon-14 anomalies and just cool stuff like that, Doug. Yeah. So what are we titling this program, you know? Carbon-14 dating and fossils. And, oh, pretty uh, simple, I guess. Okay. And the Creation Research Society quarterly, we're going to take our uh, notes from. Uh, there was an article in there by uh, Brian Thomas and Vance Nelson. Uh, Vance Nelson was a, a fellow that uh, uh, our cameraman and I, uh, Larry Perry, uh, went with uh, in 2007 to the Joggins uh, oh, there, up uh, in Nova Scotia area? Nova or? Scotia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We were there with Ian Juby and uh, Vance Nelson. Vance did an excellent job in a, a presentation in, in Ham Amherst. Uh, in uh, Amherst, Amherst in Nova, Nova Scotia. Okay, yeah. yeah, that's why I've heard of Amherst. I've not heard of yeah. Amherst. Okay, so anyway, whatever. So go ahead. Uh, we were going to talk about the uh, uh, carbon fourteen and uh, this article that he was talking about, but I wanted to first uh, uh, re refer to this BBC. Uh, announcement that came out that uh, mm -hmm. I found really fascinating and the guy who pointed it out, uh, his name is um, uh, Manny and uh, uh, he says that, the, well isn't this sort of like the, an excuse, the dog ate my homework type of thing. Well. <laughs> and uh, what they found was, <coughs> what they're actually predicting is that uh, within uh, maybe by 2050 um, carbon-14 dating, dating won't be uh, meaningful at all because there's so much emission gases from fossil fuel, uh, burning fossil fuels, polluting the air, uh, <laughs> according to them, that it, uh, uh, anything that's dated from then on is sort of like you put on new clo clothes and it'll have the, the carbon-14 uh, date of, of, of a thousand years. Yeah, William the Conqueror will have, you know, put <coughs> brand new clothes. Well. Of course, this goes to prove uh, some of the things that we've been talking about before, although in mm -hmm. a sense it's in kind of an inverse situation. Mm -hmm. Stroud of Turin, the carbon-14 dates, had basically said it's, it was a, it's a forgery or, a, or an art, artifact with the emphasis on art created around mm -hmm. 1250 AD as opposed to being the real Shroud of Turin based on carbon-14 dating, and of course there's been a lot of <coughs> Well, Rich, studies. first, uh, catch them up, uh, uh, that's uh, coming from this BBC article. Yes, okay. And, and they accused uh, 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 that uh, the Shroud of Turin was a fake because uh, of the carbon-14 date. And right, and that's, that's what I was getting to, but as far as that. <coughs> and the carbon-14 date, what, what's really been the problem with it is, uh, number one, no one has been, as far as I know, has been able to really duplicate what the Shroud of Turin is, actually. Even with right. modern knowledge of <coughs> negative, because it's a, it's a negative, and when you, when you photograph and you look at the negative, it becomes a positive. Uh, no artist or, or we have not been able to duplicate the process of how it would have been done, and, and so somebody supposedly did it in the 1200s. But beside all that, all the, uh, and there's also, there are what they call uh, little um, artifacts within the cloth that that seemed to represent it was a first century piece of cloth, the herringbone right, yeah. weave. There's just a lot of things involved in it. But more importantly, the actual part that was supposedly off was actually, uh, there, were, there were some parts in the cloth itself that were burned in the, in the, 12, in the 1200, 1250 or whatever. Mm -hmm. And the nuns sewed up some cloth and the carbon-14 samples were taken from, and it, it looks like they were taken pieces that probably were from, it, they always over contamination, Doug. Mm -hmm. That's the ultimate contamination. They probably got fibers from the 12th century cloth. But there's so many other things, including little little pieces of uh, grain and, and little micro micro things that are in there. Um, but again, no one has been able to really duplicate it with all of our modern technology, the image on the shroud. That aside, Doug, the carbon-14 would almost make the, if that was the, if it was the case now, let's put it that way, mm -hmm. <clears throat> then to get an, an age of 1250 B.A.D., this this cloth would have had to be made probably 20 years from now. Well, that <laughs> so it sort of screwed up in an inverse way. What's really going on right now uh, is is worth, and we want to get to the subject at hand. But it's it, it I get to go to show you that all these dating methods can be subject to contamination or problems. So you have to do a lot of things to try to protect yourself from that. These creation scientists though, Doug, <clears throat> uh, decided, look, from our worldview, the world is young, 
right? Mm -hmm. If that's the case, then organic material, what if, you know, unmineralized bone, plants, mummified tissue, whatever, we should be able to find some carbon-14 even in the oldest things if they're, if they're truly, if they're truly uh, not, not mummified or whatever, or not, I mean, not, not mineralized totally. You should be able to find That's right, yeah. And so, but even say that, we have talked many times on our show, Doug, how we found, car they, they have found carbon-14 in samples of coal and also in the matrix of diamonds, which seems to be really inordinately yeah. impossible. Now let me talk a little, little bit about what's actually happening right now and uh, I've, I've been getting some reports uh, from some of my creationist friends that saying that uh, uh, the, the labs who are doing carbon-14 dating are uh, actually getting you know, wind that the creationists are using it against them. And, yes. and so uh, if there's any suspicion that uh, a sample is coming in from a creationist, uh, they're uh, refusing to actually do the, the study. Again, what kind of science is this? You people out there that do this are hypocritical liars to do that kind of stuff. You, you, I'm sorry, I got to call it the way it is, Doug. This is censorship in the mm -hmm. worst form possible. This is not science. Who cares if a creationist gives it? If you get a date, what, what does it matter to you if you're true scientists? No, you have an agenda. And don't be lying to people saying you don't and you're objective scientists. You're not. Mm -hmm. You are lying to people when you get dates you don't like. And we get dates we don't, they don't like a lot. We're not saying we get all the dates we want either. In fact, we know a lot of times we don't get. We, we know in some of the aging, not covered 14 so much, but uh, dates uh, with some of the other methods of the use, mm. we get inordinately long dates, okay? When we've had to figure out, well, why do that? Why does it happen? I think it's good research. Well, I have to understand but, there's uh, certain assumptions that go into re the radioisotope dating methods. Right. And, um, you know, for example, they uh, assume that the, the decay rate is a, a constant. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the first assumption. The second assumption is that there's no intrusion of, uh, of uh, daughter element or any leaching of the uh, parent element out of the sample. Okay. That would al also give a, uh, uh, an inordinate long date. And, uh, or a short date. Or a short date. And so, uh, and then, like, like for example, uh, I do know that uh, in some of the dating methods that uh, have um, metals involved, such as rubidium, strontium, potassium, argon, uh, well, Uranium rubidium, lead, strontium, yeah, lead, the, the, lead, you know, all these, yeah, the solubility of the uh, of the of the daughter element is uh, much less than the solubility of the parent element. And so what you oh. have is the, the possibility of uh, you know, differential leaching of Is it is of this the like chemicals. water action? Or water primary? action. Okay. It would, uh, uh, and uh, somebody claimed that, uh, you know, they've actually done experiments where they've uh, raised the date of, uh, of uh, a potassium argon sample just by running water over it. Really? That would not surprise me. In this case, though, we're dealing with the, with the uh, with the very popular concept called carbon-14. Almost everyone has heard of that. Now, what most people don't understand is carbon-14 is useless for deep time fossils or deep time things because, or should be useless because after 100,000 years, and Doug said to me, I didn't question that, but let's give it the, the farthest out you can get, 100,000 years, you should pretty much have nothing. You can't get any, what, is, what are the spectroscopy? Mm -hmm. you know, what the, 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 how do they get the stuff to, to calibrate? What are the machine, what's the? No, uh, it's uh, an accelerated mass spectrometer, uh, yeah. uh, just spectrophotometer. There should be nothing after 100,000 years. And so they would not even look at, let's say, a, a Tyrannosaurus Rex skull or a Triceratops horn or uh, a plant from a Carboniferous period. They would not look at anything like that because de facto there should be nothing there. But we begin to find things, Doug. Isn't that what this article is saying? We're, right. we're finding it. Not only are we finding it, it's not anomalously being found. <coughs> it's, founding, it's being found all pervasively. It's being right. found virtually in everything they're testing. What they were trying to find in the <coughs> right. study, particular study, uh, was uh, they had 16 samples that they uh, looked at. Okay. And um, they were trying to find one sample that was uh, devoid of of carbon fourteen, right? Because you would expect that, uh, given the deep time, 
uh, that they attribute to these particular fossils. When we say deep time, we mean millions of years, okay? Right. And the rate study, which was done uh, in the 2000, between 2000 and 2005, um, which is called radioisotopes in the age of the Earth, um, right. it was an ex extensive study on radioisotope dating. They uh, did carbon-14 on uh, 10 coal samples, uh, 10 diamonds, they did uh, uh, samples of wood and shell fossils and limestone. And uh, all of those uh, uh, particular uh, samples uh, exhibited uh, uh, carbon-14 in, in it. Now, as I understand, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, but it's some of these earlier tests, they couldn't totally exclude the possibility that some contamination might have might have messed it up. And so right. this, they're, they're, they've been doing some, they, these guys are doing new testing right. to eliminate those possibilities. And they've really done some amazing stuff to eliminate the possibility of carbon, uh, of, of contamination. And I was reading some of the things, and you have it in your notes here, Doug, uh, right. some of the tests they had, they, acetic acid, and why don't you, can you maybe explain okay, some Okay, the what, they the, what they first did was that uh, any extraneous materials uh, were removed uh, by physical scraping. And so they made sure that they uh, extracted just the core uh, <coughs> part of it uh, uh, that uh, they were going to do the dating. Then they soaked it overnight in acetic acid, and that's to remove any uh, contamination. And then, uh, uh, <coughs> let me, and, and then they... Uh, what is acetic acid, by the way, Doug? It, it's vinegar. Oh, it's vinegar? Okay, and that, and that really gets rid of yeah. Contaminants type of things, uh, but the the pure form of vin you know the, uh, the pure form of vinegar is acetic acid. Okay. Uh, so uh, this really strong stuff when you uh, <coughs> uh, when it's concentrated. So uh, it, it really does uh, does a work on it. And and then they t took uh, two grams of the of the bone. Uh, uh, they crushed it. And uh, one of the problems with uh, carbon fourteen dating is that it destroys the sample. <laughs> so uh, yeah. again, it's not repeatable, and <coughs> you have to trust that uh, you got it right the first time. Right the first time yeah. yeah, and then <coughs> then they, after they crushed the sample, they retreat it with, with acetic acid until uh, you get all the, uh, and then they evacuate carbon uh, carbon dioxide out of it, and then uh, they dry it and treat it uh, with uh, uh, hydrochloric acid. <laughs> and, wow. and then uh, the resulting uh, uh, carbon dioxide is catalytic converted to graphite. And so now you have the sample. Okay. And so this is your carbon that you're going to measure the carbon-14 in. And basically, uh, for <coughs> those who are not aware, <coughs> you might want to explain that carbon-14 is, is an unstable isotope of carb carbon. Carbon-12 mm. is what's most common. In, right. And there is also a carbon-13 isotope. That's right. <clears throat> but carbon-14, it will decay as long, and, and basically when you're alive, you so you, you you basically uh, have both carbon-12 and carbon-14 from the atmosphere coming into your, coming into mm -hmm. the living system. This really, this by the way, this is tested for on living things primarily, okay? Right. <clears throat> and so, but when you die, the, the unstable isotope begins to decay, mm -hmm. the, and so your ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 will change over time, and that's how that works. And the simplest, mm -hmm. I'm being simplistic here, but that's kind of what it is. And so they can, supposedly, you can measure that if the rates are constant, no other contaminants are added, mm -hmm. as you mentioned before, or leached off. So, um, so these sixteen, that, these sixteen samples uh, were uh, subjected to this test, and the whole thing was not to actually go and try to calibrate the dating method. But was uh, was to actually detect the uh, presence of carbon fourteen. See if, see if it was anywhere. Right. What did they find, Doug? Well, uh, each of the samples did have carbon fourteen in it, and it had a uh, enough to uh, give it a date. Now they uh, based their dates on a uh, standard. Now they calibrated to this particular standard date. Okay. And so uh, the question, of course, they use the. Um, the evolutionary model to uh, calibrate it to. So they calibrate to the fossils that they, you know, the, so it's a theory that they're doing a calibration. Right, they're imposing already, but even saying that, Doug, some of these fossils they tested, they have triceratops horn, mm -hmm. 
They've had, uh, they had just, uh, there's all kinds of things that they're like, Edmontosaurus, which is a duck-billed dinosaur. Yeah, well, I'll go through the list <laughs> yeah, of them Yeah, why don't you go through the list, because let them know what it is. Yeah, the first sample that he had was uh, a, mumma, a piece of mummified fruit. Okay. And uh, this is uh, uh, found in, uh, in the lignite. Uh, let me see, it's bronchihole lignite is what it was, where it was. Then they uh, had a medullary bone of hadrosaur, and this was in the Hell Creek Formation. Uh, the vertebrae of an Edmontosaurus, and that was in the Lance Formation. Skull bone and scales uh, 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 phanerodosis. What is, what is that? What, what is it called? Uh, Let me see. Let's see if you can read this here. Pheridos. Okay. Yeah, pheridos, uh, pheridos. Yeah. Yeah, pheriotis or something like that. Mm -hmm. There's a Greek little AE type of combination. So, mm -hmm. I, which I'm not sure what that is. Do you know what that is, then? Uh, I, I, I think a, I think it's a. Okay. Yeah, that would be a fish. I think it's a fish, yeah. The Green River Formation gives oh, that away, okay. That's fish, yeah. yeah. The metacarpal bone of a ceratopsian, and that was in the Horseshoe Cam and Canyon Formation. Okay. Uh, cortical bone of a hadosaur in the Hell Creek Formation. Uh, a, a phalanx from the Edmontosaurus and from the Lance Formation. A caudal vertebrae, uh, that's tailbone. I think, uh, from the hadrosaur, and yeah, that was in the horseshoe uh, canyon formation. Paddlefish cartilage in the Green River formation. Uh, we have a horn uh, core from the Triceratops, um, and that was uh, Mark Armitage's. Mark Armitage's one, yep. Yeah. Uh, caudal vertebrae from the Ceratopsian, uh, horseshoe canyon formation. Uh, unmineralized axle wood from the Buchanan Lake Formation, and I think this is from the Axel Heidelberg um, uh, Island up uh, in uh, none of it. Uh, uh, Canada. The province up yeah. there. Uh, and there was a peat-like drumheller wood, and uh, uh, that's from Canada. Uh, a, a horn core uh, biopartite from a, a Triceratops, the Hell Creek Formation. Uh, carbonized wood from a, uh, it was a, a, a from Czechoslovakia, uh, and then a vertebrae, a jaw and a, a jaw and a leg from a, a Capturhinus. What is that? <laughs> Do we know what that is? I, I couldn't. I've not heard that name before. I think it's fascinating though because we've talked many times over of dinosaurs. They are most the most evocative. Uh, thing for the average audience. The mm -hmm. triceratops has got the three horns, the nose horn, the two two brow horns, and the frill around the neck. The Edmontosaurus mm -hmm. is a large duck bill, kind of a flat, uh, you know, walked primarily on hind legs, maybe hind and four legs, but he's he's a um, <clears throat> he's a duck bill. Uh, these are supposedly millions of years old dinosaurs. Uh, I mean, Doug, it's interesting. I remember when Buddy Davis was talking about coming coming back from Canada, finding actually not unmineralized. Bones, and I, I was shocked at that. Yeah, that was from Hax, Axel Heidelberg Island. Is that what it was? That and, and, yeah. and mummified stuff. So there was stuff that's there that was really. And I just read recently; it might have been in this era, in this magazine as well. They've actually found some mummified skin tissue that was mm -hmm. real, not 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 stone. I've always read years right, yeah. they've had impression fossilized skin. That this was actually maybe real skin uh, had not been mineralized. Point of it is, is that. Is is that they have found carbon fourteen in all of these samples? Yeah. Whether and, and using the uh, dates that the evolutionists would give for this, uh, based upon the me uh, the calibration me uh, based upon the evolutionary assum assumptions, it comes from uh, into the range from about seventeen thousand to uh, forty thousand years. Now here's here now here this begs a question. Even using their assumptions, right. you've got triceratops living 70, 17,000, or what did you say, to 400, well, how much? 40,000 years. 40,000 years. 40, years, yes. That's not a biblical time frame that we believe is the correct thing, but it's far and away closer to the biblical time frame than 68 million years old. Right. 68 million, do people understand how far away that is compared to what these dates are showing? Even using evolutionary scenarios? This is, to me, radical it's, and it's it's why i think that the powers that be who have the deck stacked 
mm. don't want this evidence to get out. And this know? is uh, 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 taking not taking into account the fact that the, it's not really been established that the generation of of carbon-14 in the atmosphere is a constant rate. We don't know, yeah. And uh, it's really not likely that over the tens of thousands of years that uh, evolutionists would uh, assume for that, uh, that it would have been a constant rate. And so uh, this is part of the problem is to, you know, what uh, are the assumptions of a method and uh, uh, are those assumptions valid? Well, it seems to me, Doug, pretty apparent that based on really all the dating methods have assumptions that apparently are flawed. <clears throat> and we said that even with the long age ones, like the rubidium strontium, the potassium argon, uranium lead ones, and all those ones that give you really deep, deep time, uh, there, are time there are things they've tested that give you ranges even they can't accept. Like, for example, a rock that's 40, 40 billion years old. Mm -hmm. Well, they, they throw that out. Right, yeah. And, and, if, if, and if there's a rock that's too young, they throw that out. But again, then how can, and, the, and every time something's wrong according to the preconceived notions, then it's got contamination or something. But then how can you really trust any of it? I'm right. not saying that, the, that, that these dates aren't doing generally this or generally that, but the point of it is, we don't know things are constant. Well, Cubs one of the uh, well. next uh, pieces of study for IDNO2 uh, research will be to try to come up with a calibration method for for these uh, uh, for the carbon-14 dating. What do methods. they really mean, based on from right? You know, that, that's by. part of the uh, whole thing. Is that uh, we can probably uh, uh, come up with uh, enough samples of uh, of known uh, dates, you know, of uh, of artifacts. Uh, to a actually establish a uh, thing that's where you can calibrate this. Well, since we, like I say, and since we apparently are finding carbon-14 in pretty much everything, mm -hmm. it really begs the question, Doug, how can they possibly subscribe to millions of years for these things when based on their own scenarios it shouldn't exist? It, it just, yeah, it, diamonds, it's, uh, it's that's an anomaly really that they cannot yeah. explain. Uh, interesting to find carbon-14 in diamonds, uh, you know, formed deep in the earth, you know, based upon, uh, it's a volcanic process that produces diamonds. So how can it, yeah, so how does carbon-14, carbon yeah, how does that even happen? So, because diamonds, I mean, unless you're saying, I mean, how, how does that work? Because diamonds are not, uh, we, I would always talk like, I remember reading the old Superman cartoons, he'd squeeze mm -hmm. a piece of coal and turn it into a diamond. It's like, when diamonds, were diamonds actually at one time coal under compression? But yeah, one, uh, is that what it is? It's supposedly what it was for people. Well, uh, uh, I was reading this, you remember when we went to the Crater of Diamonds in Arkansas? Right. Yeah, there, there was a book that I got from there that talks about uh, the diamond mine and that they were digging up uh, uh, unfossilized wood from way down deep in the, the, the diamond, diamond mine. Mm. Uh, and and uh, there came out another version of that. Jody Shackravity got that second version. Yes. And that uh, part of the article uh, was, was gone. See, these guys are such censorship. They, they, they censor anything they don't like. Uh, rather than rather than really do real science. By, real by the truth. way, uh, I, I see in the news that uh, there was a lady who was out there uh, digging for a diamond, and got an eight carat diamond. So, really? Yeah. Boy, wow, <coughs> wow. And, and so uh, she had uh, quite the luck there. <laughs> I guess we never had it. We've been there twice, and we never got diddly squat. I yeah, think, I, I, think I, I found some mica. And <laughs> That's all we found was mica. <laughs> oh, here's a shite. It's mica, nothing. You know, we never found one yeah. diamond. Diamond, we didn't find I remember, uh, I have a picture of a guy that we met out there, and we yep. talked to him. He's got his own little sluice thing yeah, made of a Yeah, hand. he was all day long, and he, got, he was getting diamonds. Yeah, he, would, uh, uh, he was actually making enough to live on, but he was, uh, he was working work, 10 hours a day, seven days hard, a week. Man. And and so, the diamonds we had in the Arkansas, but they're. <coughs> I got a picture where the, uh, the Strawn Wagner diamond was uh, uh, dug up, and that was the perfect diamond. Yeah. Uh, was that a blue diamond or? Yeah. No, it was a 
uh, perfect in every uh, way, a zero, zero, zero on yeah. the, on the wow. scale, and it's always uh, isn't that, isn't uh, that the only diamond mine in the United States? Though, isn't that the only? Yeah, one? it is. Uh, yeah. Uh, I don't know if there's uh, anything up in Canada, but uh, I do know that there's. Uh, that's the only place in, in the United States, in the United States where yeah. you can. Uh, it's actually the only place in the world where the public can go in go, and yeah. and search for diamonds <laughs> themselves. The uh, you know, the family in South Africa, oh, no, the, uh, Beers? the Beers family, oh, no, uh, you're not getting in there. Uh, control everything in uh, South Africa. So. Well, no, and sometimes it's because they control the market. They can keep the price up. Basically, right, yeah. they get all the diamonds you want to do. But anyway, <clears throat> it's a fascinating thing now to to find out. A carbon fourteen, uh, contrary to what we thought in the past, is not 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 merely not our enemy, but is actually becoming right. our friend. And you know? uh, I would encourage uh, the evolutionists to uh, consider. Uh, carbon-14 dating uh, all the fossils that you find. I would also consider, I think the creationists are probably going to have to get their own labs. Right. We, their, own, their own stuff, because basically these people are sensors and they are not honest and uh, you know there are there are evolution, I like what's her name, uh, Schweitzer, I think she's an honest one even though she's totally anti-creationist and, and uh, pro-evolution mm -hmm. and pro-deep time but her studies take her to where it's going to go. There are honest evolutionary scientists I'm not denying that fact, but by and large, the polemicists for the for the evolutionary lobby, those who really understand that there's a philosophical worldview at stake, will censor us in e at every turn. And so the mm -hmm. creations are going to have to get their own labs eventually. Um, but all the money, unfortunately, is on the side of the evolutionists. I would like to point, see you know? double blind studies. That's what I like. Yeah, uh, where uh, you have the sample dated by two different uh, laboratories. Right. <clears throat> Neither laboratory knows uh, which sample they've got. Yeah, that would be good. Yeah. Well, we hope you enjoyed our show tonight. We'll see you next time on Revolution Against Evolution.